He is James Cleverly, Conservative MP, also Conservative leadership candidate, and now, after being Foreign Secretary and Home Secretary in the last Conservative government, Shadow Home Secretary. Good morning to you. Julia, hi. Great to have you finally in the studio. Really appreciate you joining us. Um, there are a lot of topical news stories I'd like to get to, but um, yeah. I will I will leave those aside because I do want to talk about Tory leadership because actually uh, how good a government we get often depends on how good an opposition we have. Mm. We, that's how democracy works. So why do you think, it's a question I've asked all the Tory leadership candidates so far, just why do you think you're the best candidate for the job? There are four of you left in it. Why should people choose you? Well, I'm probably doing myself a disservice by saying I think all four of us uh, bring real strength. The reason I know that I'm the best placed person to lead the Conservative Party whilst in opposition and lead us back into government is because of the experience and the track record that I've got. Not just running government departments, although that matters, you need to understand how government works properly at the most senior levels to be able to properly criticise the government and my gosh they need criticising at the moment. But also having run CCHQ, having run our campaigning operation during the very successful 2019 general, general election, and the fact that, as you know, Julia, I have been the spokesperson, the face and voice for the Conservative Party when in government in some of the most difficult and challenging circumstances. So I know that I am the most effective communicator and also that I have always maintained a really good working relationship with all the various tribes... Uh, there within are the a party. lot of tribes. Well, fewer than they used to be. And actually, the well, there leader... There are fewer MPs than they used true. to be. But the next leader of the Conservative Party needs to be able to make sure that every single one of the parliamentary party and all the people in our associations, all our councillors, all our candidates are all pulling in the same direction. And I've always maintained a really well, good relationship is, right across the This country. is one of my issues, and I've written about this, talked about this on air a lot. A lot of the candidates are talking about, we need to have unity, we need mm. to have unity. Well, it depends what you have unity about, because mm. there's a lot of talk that the likes of Kemi Bajanok and and, uh, and Robert Jenrick sort of want to pull the party, quote, to the right, and that you and Tom Tugendhat, uh, of the four remaining, remaining candidates, are sort of the centre ground candidates but given that the centre ground of British politics now is basically Tony Blair um, <laughs> a lot of Conservative voters as you know particularly for Conservative members are saying look you know we, we haven't changed our views on anything but you lot have just moved over to the metropolitan elite views uh, of London and actually you no longer represent Conservative values so, so if you think you can bring everyone together and talk to everyone communicate to everyone what, what, what will you stand for? Well Julia um, I know you have an advice advantage that not all of your listeners and viewers will have in that you have known me for a long time and you have heard me talk about my political philosophy off camera when there was no one to 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 judge Can't me shut him up. And, um, <laughs> but the point is but the point is i know at the moment it is convenient for some people to try and paint me into a particular corner um, and there's a leadership race and it's in their interest to do so. But, you know, I've always been uh, staunchly Thatcherite. I've been advocating lower taxes and less regulation since before I can remember. Did you bother to do that when you were in the Cabinet? Because it didn't seem to have been very successful lobbying. So one of the points that I make is that when you have disagreements, when you have debates in government, you do so privately. Once decisions are made, collective responsibility means you've got to defend them Did you challenge taxes going up and bigger government while you were in government? So I have always, I have always sought to bring down the cost of government. I'll give you an example. Not uh, what people so say... No, no, did you challenge, did yes. you say to the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, which so are the many have... you served under, I don't think this is right? So... I have always, always pushed for lower taxes, less regulation throughout my entire, including the times in government. I'm not going to go into details exactly when, because the whole point of collective responsibility is you have your rows in private yeah. and then you front it up collectively. Okay. But when I, when I was running, we're here in uh, London Bridge. Not far from here is the headquarters of the uh, London Fire Brigade. When I ran the London Fire Authority, I made it more efficient. I reduced its costs. So I have not just talked the talk, I have actually delivered. Okay. And that's the final point I'll make in terms of why me, because right. we have to get back into the habit of delivering, not just talking. But yeah, I mean, we, yeah, de delivering is what really matters. And a lot of people said that they agreed with a lot of things that the Conservatives said, a lot of Conservative voters, uh, but they, you didn't actually deliver in, in government. I'm not want to focus on looking back, because, you know, we've got four or five years ahead mm -hmm. of a Starmer government and we need to have an alternative. Again, I think we get better government on, from whichever major party or any party that wins if we have 
have better opposition. Mm. But um, in, in terms of like, conservative values, a question I've put to all the leadership candidates as well, what do you think conservative values are? Because again, we haven't seen them put into practice in recent years in terms of we've had, we've had higher taxes, we've had loads of control over our lives, um, we've had uh, uh, more regulation, uh, we've had a massive expansion of the civil service, mm. we've had you know all of those things. None of that strikes most Conservative voters as being Conservative, which is why so many of them either A, stayed at home on mm. election day, or B, four million plus of them went and voted for reform. Well, we have got to recognise that when the British people kick you out of office, they are demanding that you do an audit of what you did wrong. And you are absolutely right. We let taxes get too high. And when the Labour Party was criticising the Conservative government for having uh, tax levels too high, <laughs> you, you, you know that tax levels are gone. Now, you and I both know that what's happened now, which is the second they get into office, they start ramping up taxes. Which is what you guys would have done as well. No, 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 no. No, but the point is, what we would have is a moot point because we kicked out, we were kicked out of government and therefore we've got to recognise what we need to do differently. So we need to bring taxes down. Mm. And this nonsense that the Labour Party are putting forward that somehow you can do it with a little tweak here, a little tweak there, mm. going after non-doms and the super rich, it doesn't work. So we have got to recognise we need to reduce public spending if we're going to bring down taxes. I've always believed in that. Except the public need... say they want better public services and we've just been told by Keir Starmer only this week you can't have low taxes and better public services. Well that's not what he was saying. It's not what he was saying before We will election. touch upon hypocrisy by Keir mm. Starmer I suspect uh, mm. in the future but this is the classic problem. The sales pitch he was making before the election and his actions after uh, he got elected are completely opposite to each other. So we, if they won't be honest with the British people, we need to be honest with the British yep. people. We, if we want economic growth, we've got to ease up on the regulation because it's stifling okay. economic growth. Dif as, yeah, what are Conservative values? Lower taxes, less regulation, stronger defence. Is that enough to appeal boards. to those reform voters who went to reform, went to Nigel Farage and think that they're now the real opposition? Well, we, you can't get back into power if you don't win that. So back. we have got to be the real opposition. We've got to be the most effective opposition. I know I'm best placed. So to what do policies that. do you think would bring them back? Well, it's not just about a policy thing. It's not about a policy thing. It's about making sure mm. that we deliver on the promises we make, which means fewer promises, but delivering on the promises that we make. It's about showing a credible path to lower taxes rather than just talking about lower taxes. It okay. means, in my old portfolio, when we talk about bringing down net migration, what I did was I changed the visa rules, which are now, which, which are now bringing down net migration by about 300,000 yeah. people per year. But you were a part of a government that oversaw those visa rules being basically giving a free-for-all yeah, for 1.2 million people. But, net, it was 750,000, but 1.2 million people coming to this country after the British public had said repeatedly in every single election since 2010, we'd like lower yeah. immigration. Please. And when I was directly responsible for immigration, it came and did up. you? And did Julie, you? Julie, Julie, that Julie, was our bar, but no, 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 no. That was after. I, that was plot after that. Those figures emerged. They appeared. Those ONS figures came out. Yeah. They appeared to come as a complete surprise to the government. So, I was appointed in mid-November. By the beginning of December, I put things in place okay. that brought those figures down. Two weeks into the job, and you can track it. Plot the graph. Right. Figures going up I'll and take, up and yeah. up cleverly takes over, figures start okay. coming down. All right then, right. But before we, uh, we've got to take a quick break, but I do want to also ask you about, you know, a former foreign secretary, of course. Um, we, there was lots of talk of a temporary ceasefire deal being expected between Israel and Hezbollah that could have come into force earlier this morning. Mm. We had a statement in the last hour from Benjamin Netanyahu's office in Israel uh, saying the reports are simply quite not true. The news about the supposed directive to moderate the fighting in the north is also the opposite of the truth, they say. Uh, we've had Keir Starmer, the Prime Minister, over at the UN General Assembly and speaking to the Security Council, calls from um, you know, US, Britain, EU, mm. EU, many other Middle Eastern countries for there to be a 21-day ceasefire. Um, would you support those calls? Do you think that is what we need? Or do you think, actually, that Israel is quite justified in continuing the fighting against a prescribed terrorist organisation that has been bombing Israel well, since October the 8th? Well, we now recognise 
uh, publicly what I've always known, having been a former Foreign Secretary, calling for a ceasefire and getting a ceasefire yeah. are very different things. And now the Labour Party and government, they are realising that their performative nonsense and opposition doesn't cut any mustard. If you want to make change, you've got to do the legwork. When uh, I was the first foreign minister to go to Israel after the 7th of October attacks, I toured the Middle East, going to the Qataris, going to the Saudis, going to Israel, go talking to the Palestinian leadership. So you actually have to put in the work. You can't just shout yeah. from the sidelines like Labour are doing. The bottom line is that Israel is being attacked by terrorist groups from its western border and from its northern border. They do have the right to self-defence. I have always said, and I've said this directly to the Israeli president and the Israeli prime minister and members of the Israeli government, that they are duty-bound to defend themselves with professionalism, with consideration of human life, particularly civilian life, and that they should always comply with international Well, they're being held to a higher, higher account than uh, the British forces uh, and American forces and all of our allies' forces in terms of the civilian uh, death toll. Well, the, and, the, and, and this is why, this is why... Uh, suggesting that uh, when c civilian casualties happen that that is inevitably uh, an indicator of wrongdoing. It is not as straightforward as that, but they are duty-bound, and I've made this clear mm. directly, face-to-face, -face, th that they are duty-bound to act with professionalism and restraint. I've, you know, When I was Foreign Secretary, I received assurances mm -hmm. to that effect, and we have to hold them to those okay. uh, assurances. Right, we're going to take a very quick break, and then I want to talk to you about, well, uh, where we are in terms of prison release, and, of course, the latest uh, freebies uh, for Keir Starmer and your uh, thoughts on all of that. Do stay tuned. This is Talk, the home of common sense. Still with me is James Cleverly, a Conservative MP, of course, former Foreign Secretary and Home Secretary, now Shadow Home Secretary, and, of course, Tory leadership candidate. Just want to get to two more topics. First of all, I just want to talk about um, prisons. I know, obviously, the, you know, Shadow Home Secretary prisons come under justice, but, of course, very much linked. <laughs> Police can't arrest anybody if they've got no prison places. Uh, but dozens of prisoners mistakenly released early from jail after a system error that classed them, even though they were domestic stalkers, under another law. Um, a th or something like a fifth of uh, those who released from uh, Winchester Prison have had to be recalled because they breached their licence. We are looking at absolute chaos in our criminal justice system. Um, did it start under you lot? Well, I'm going to make no apology for locking up criminals. And uh, when, when people, when officials said to us that oh, we might need to tell the police to arrest fewer people because of the prison place shortage, I said no. Arrest people that need to be arrested. We were managing the situation. It was a, it was a challenging. The, the, the prisons were going to become too overcrowded if you had won. If you'd won the election, well, you would face exactly so, the same issue that, that Keir Starmer faced. No, I disagree because the officials kept saying, "Oh, you have to do this." And we said, no, we will manage it, and we managed it. And there were times when we said, oh, if you don't do it by this date, mm. and that date came and went, we managed it. The bottom line is, what we've seen, Rachel Reeves did it with winter fuel allowance, the Ministry of Justice are doing it now, Keir Starmer did it with arms export controls to Israel. They are just doing what their officials tell them to do. And frankly, if all ministers do is follow the instructions of civil servants, we should get rid of these useless ministers and get the civil servants to run the country. Oh, I thought they were, as far as I was gathering, they not were running the watch. country these not days. Not on my watch. Right, let, let, me talk about, uh, let me talk about not civil servants, but donors. Mm. Um, Keir Starmer has been under a lot of pressure after a suit gate, glass gate, frock gate, all the freebies from Lord <laughs> Wahid Ali, uh, a Labour peer, uh, who's given donations to many people on the front bench the Labour Party. Uh, latest is Flatgate. Uh, the Prime Minister claimed about 20 grand's worth, he claims, in value of a loan of his, uh, this £18 million central London penthouse owned by Lord Ali during the election campaign. I think a lot of us thought it was actually just for campaign work. Turns out his family were living there. He claims it was because his son was doing GCSEs. There was too much noise from uh, uh, reporters outside his uh, property in Kentridge Town. Apparently, Kentridge Town doesn't have a library. Oh, yeah, it does, <laughs> uh, where his son could have worked. Um, he also claims it was only worth the equivalent of 450 uh, pounds um, a, a night. Um, probably pretty unlikely for an £18 million pound penthouse in Covent Garden. Um, is there anything wrong with him using that uh, penthouse? So the problem is the hypocrisy. So if he is recording those things properly, if he is open and transparent, that's fine. That's what he said. What, what, and I'll, I, look, I am willing to take him at his word at this point. The problem is the hypocrisy. So whilst he was doing these things, he was criticising the Conservatives for doing exactly what he was doing. And the British people hate hypocrisy. So 
uh, receiving donations, receiving hospitality, those things are recorded, we can be uh, judged by our electors, that is right and proper. But if you're going to make a, a moralistic campaign against your political opponents on that basis, then you absolutely have to make sure your behaviour is whiter than white. And, and he was doing exactly what he criticised others for. Um, that is hypocrisy and that is one of the biggest sins in British politics. What do you make of him uh, filming his December the 21st, so December 2021 sorry, broadcast urging people to stay at home, work from home, this was during the Omicron wave of Covid, when actually he and his party were calling for more lockdowns and more restrictions, which your party didn't go ahead with, mainly because the party gate revelations had just come out and there was too much pressure on Boris Johnson to not do that. But uh, this, it appears, was uh, this broadcast telling people to work from home was filmed at Lord Ali's home, not Keir Stark farmer's home, there were some family photographs, uh, Christmas cards behind him, uh, clearly aimed at making us think he was in his own study uh, at home. We also recorded a, a tribute to the late Queen from there in 2022. Does that uh, change your, your view at all? Well, again, it's the, it's the hypocrisy. If he's demanding that people don't move around, if he's demanding that people stay in their own properties, not anyone else's, whilst being in someone else's house. Again, it's the hypocrisy. The problem here is the hypocrisy. And we're seeing it over and over again. We're seeing uh, Labour politicians telling pensioners to, to put a few more blankets because they don't deserve the winter fuel allowance, whilst then giving massive financial awards to their union paymasters. That's hypocrisy. Telling people that they should stay at home whilst going to someone else's house, that's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Telling people that they uh, are telling people that the Conservatives are uh, legitimate targets for criticism for receiving hospitality and donations okay. whilst receiving hospitality and donations, that is hypocrisy. What about, I mean, is it, any, is, is it better or worse than the Tories accepting tens of millions of pounds from Frank Hester, a man recorded making the most outrageous racist remarks? I mean, you know, so, is that any better or worse? No, so the, so you, most of no, my so audience will go, you're all as bad as each other. Julia, it's, it's a fundamentally different point. Um, and, you know, he, what he said was crass, well, what I mean, he said was racist, uh, we criticised him, he's apologised. But the point is, the hypocrisy of Keir Starmer okay. is the issue at stake here. Keir Starmer's literally criticising us for doing things that he himself was doing at the time. OK, uh, James Clever, really appreciate you joining us. I know time's against us. Tory leadership candidate, they're one of the four remaining. You'll be addressing Conservative Conference yep. next week and then there'll be a whittling down to two. Thank you so much for joining us here at Talk, the home of common sense.